Today we're going to be learning all about inverses, inverse notation, how to find inverses from a graph, and how to find inverses using algebra. I put up some UNO reverse cards here just as a way to think about inverse is undoing in operation. So we want to be careful because sometimes we mix up the words inverse with opposite and it's not quite the same. So inverse, think about reverse, undoing a function. So the graph of f of x is reflected over the line y equals x, and that will create the graph of what we call the inverse. So if you think about that as an official switch from y and x, right, we're going to flip, reflect over the line y equals x. That means that wherever a was an x value, it now becomes the y value, and where b was the y value, that now becomes the x value on the graph of the inverse. Again, if we think about the switching of y is equal to x and reflecting over or switching those two out, well then the domain of f becomes the range of the inverse and the range of the original becomes the domain of the inverse. Let's take a look at how this plays out on a graph. So I'm going to give myself some coordinate points here. We'll say this was the coordinate point 1, 0, and this would be the coordinate point of 2, 1, and this will be the coordinate point of 5, 2. So if I actually do this inverse thing, I'm supposed to switch every point A, B now becomes the point B, A. So the point 1, 0 is on the original, which means the point 0, 1 lies on the inverse. The point 2, 1 was on the original, so the point 1, 2 lies on the inverse. And the point 5, 2 was on the original, so the point 1, 2 up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is on the inverse. And I can connect my dots in the same way. What I want you to notice is that we were, in fact, reflecting over the line y equals x. Right? These things are mirrored over that line. A function we'll have an inverse, which is also a function, if that original function was what we call one-to-one. -one. And a function, well, is one-to-one -one if every output corresponds with exactly one input. You are used to one in produces one out, and that's how we have a function. Well, now it's also that each out only had one in, that's going to pass the horizontal line test. And if you're like, Ms. Schwartz, what? Let's talk about it. So if I have something like a parabola, a parabola is not one-to-one. -one because if I said, hey, one input creates one output, sure, this is a function. But if I picked, let's say, an output of Four. one person could have told me the input was 2 and another person could have told me the input was negative 2 because this fails the horizontal line test. Whereas something like x to the third is 1 to 1 because for any y value that you pick, there is only one input that created it. This will pass the horizontal line test, making this one-to-one. -one. So things that aren't one-to-one, -one, they still have inverses. It's just that their inverse isn't going to be a function, and we'll see that here in just a little bit. Steps to find an inverse function. Step one is just a notation switch around. You're going to replace your function notation with the variable y. Step two is where the magic happens. You are going to switch all x for y and y's for x. Step three, you're going to isolate y. And step four, you're then going to replace y with inverse function notation, if you actually have an inverse that's a function. The last step is going to be to 
verify by composition or with a graph or algebraically, which again we'll talk we'll talk about. The idea of verifying is just that you should always check your answers in math, right? You can always go back and check and make sure that you have things done correctly. So to make sure we can find a function that's an inverse, we first want to make sure that our original function is one to one or passes the horizontal line test. So our original function is 3x minus 2, which is just some sort of a line, starts at negative 2, has a slope of 3. This line definitely passes the horizontal line test. Let's jump in and use our four steps. Sorry, five steps. Step one, change your function notation to be with y. Step two, this is where the magic happens. Switch all of your domain values and range values. So replace y with x and x with y. Step three, we're going to isolate y. So I'm going to add 2 and divide by 3. Step 4 is replace with inverse notation because our function was 1 to 1. Our inverse is definitely a function. Thinking about this from an algebraic standpoint, f of x took some number, multiplied it by 3, and then lowered it by 2. So multiply by 3, lower by 2. Our new function takes a number increases by 2 and divides by 3. It does the inverse operation, right? It undoes or backtracks the steps that we did from the original. If we check this with a graph, this is 1 half, sorry, 1 third, x plus 2 thirds. And if I were to graph that, I end up with a line like this, which is truly a reflection over that line, y equals x. The next one f of x equals 2x cubed minus 5. First thing you want to do is make sure that your function is 1 to 1, which this is a cubic function stretched by 2 and moved down 5. So it's going to look like this. This is a cubic. It's going to pass the horizontal line test because it's in a standard form, which we'll get to later. Uh, next thing then is to perform the four steps. I want you to pause your video and try those four steps and see if you can come up with this function's inverse. Pause your video and try now. So step one, rewrite with y. Step two, switch x and y. Step three, solve for y. Remember to undo a cube, you take a cubed root. And then step four is just replacing with function notation. So if we think algebraically, my original f of x took a number, raised it to the third power, multiplied by two, and then lowered by five. So to undo, I want to take a number, I want to increase by 5, then divide by 2, and then take a cubed root. So I'm reversing my steps. Here's a graph. This is our original graph of our cubic function. There it is. Here's the inverse that we found. And here's the line y equals x. Look at the fact that the blue is the red one that's been mirrored over the line y equals x. These next two get a little bit more interesting. So given g, find g inverse. But we have to check those domains and understanding if our function is 1 to 1. So the square root of x plus 2 is just a square root graph that's been moved to the left 2. That's going to be 1 to 1. So this one will have an inverse. That's a function. x minus 4 squared, though, is a parabola that's been moved to the right 4. And this is not going to pass the vertical or the horizontal line test, sorry. So when we think about these, we have to consider some restrictions on maybe looking at just a piece of our graph. So I'm going to start with g of x equals the square root of x plus 2. I want you to go through and I want you to find the inverse using our four steps. So g inverse of x, go through and find it, pause your video, do the four steps. Let's see what you come up with. So I got x squared minus 2, but x squared minus 2 is a parabola shifted down 2. But that wouldn't pass. What? That's too much, right? So instead of taking the full parabola, I'm only going to take this parabola when x is greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to split its domain, and instead of taking the whole thing, I'm only going to take when x is greater than or equal to 0, because that's the part of the graph that really mirrors 
my square root. Another way you can think about that is from the very beginning, the range of g of x, the range would have been all values greater than or equal to zero are our outputs. And I'm technically supposed to switch my x's and my y's. So my outputs were all positive numbers in the original, which means my inputs need to be all positive numbers on the inverse. Let's look at our graph. Here's our square root of x plus 2. Here's my inverse that I found. Well, if I draw in this line y equals x, all of this blue stuff to the back is not part of my reflected function. So if I instead say I want this only the positive side of the parabola, now I have the correct mirroring of that function. Don't worry, we'll keep practicing. This next one, my function to start with isn't going to have an inverse unless I start right away by restricting my domain. I'm going to choose to take just the right half of this parabola. So this is g of x, but I only want that when x is greater than or equal to 4. I only want the right half of my parabola. Go ahead and find the inverse of g. Find the inverse using the four steps. We'll talk about the domain stuff at the end. Pause now. So this is what I came up with. But again, at the end, I get this plus or minus square root which would be something that looks like this and like this. That's a problem, right? That's too much. So I need to remember that from the very beginning, I restricted my domain to be x greater than or equal to 4, which means that when I did this step here of switching my x's and y's, this should have been a y becomes greater than or equal to 4, in which case, if I look at all of these outputs, I want to start at 4, and I want to add stuff to it. I don't want to subtract stuff to it. So I'm going to keep the positive version of that square root to guarantee that my range is everything greater than or equal to 4. And again, it has to do with the fact that I chose the positive side of my parabola. Had I chose the left side and started with x is less than or equal to 4, then at the very end, I would have wanted x to be less than, or sorry, y to be less than or equal to 4, in which case I would have kept the negative version of my square root. We will continue to practice this in class. Don't stress. Last part of an inverse. A function is said to be an inverse if, and only if, when you take g of x and compose it, so put it inside of f, you get a result back of just x. Likewise, if you take f and you compose it inside of g, you get back only x. The way you can think about it is inverses are like undoing directions. So if you start at home, you go to school, that's function g, then you come home from school, that's function f, you're going to end up back where you started because g and f are inverses. So the way we verify is we find f of g of x and g of f of x. And we make sure that everything cancels itself to x. So think back to our previous lesson. I want you to start by finding the f of g of x and g of f of x. Pause your video, find those two things, and we will reconvene shortly. So when I found f of g of x, everything cancels out and I'm left with x. When I found g of f of x, everything canceled out and I was left with x. This makes sense because again, f takes a number, multiplies by 3, then adds 1. g takes a number, loses the 1, and divides by 3. So you've started at home, you multiply by 3, you add 1. To go back home, you subtract 1, divide by 3, and you return to where you were. Important things from here, you jump back to my first slide, ah, time, whoop. Inverse notation using a graph and algebra. We will continue to practice the domain restrictions in class. Make sure you ask good questions as they come up. Great job.